internacionais. E hoje nós temos a honra e a felicidade de contarmos com o um professor da John Hopkins, uma, uma universidade bastante é, renomada. E porque ele não fala o nosso idioma português, nós vamos utilizar o idioma em inglês como idioma deste webinar. So, thank you very much, everyone, for being here attending this webinar today. So, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Richard Lee from the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's going to talk about the role of the HPA axis and the neuroendocrine system in psychiatric disorders. But today, I would like to thank you, but thank you also for give thanks for Professor Miran Hayashi. Professor Miran Hayashi is in the charge. He's, she's in the charge of this webinar. She's part of the Capspring program of UNIFESP in the theme inflammation. And all of this will happen today because he, she was contacting Professor Richard Lee and she was organizing everything behind the scenes. So on behalf of the postgraduate studies and research office, I would like to thank you, Professor Miron Hayashi, for being such a wonderful researcher, such a wonderful person, and someone that contributes a lot for the development of our university. And Professor Miron Hayashi, Uh, she was born and educated in Brazil, and she's currently Associated Professor of Pharmacology at the Federal University of Sao Paulo and Head of the Molecular Pharmacologic Laboratory at the Department of Pharmacology at the Escola Paulista uh, de Medicina. And Professor Hayashi is also Vice Chief of the Discipline in Cellular Pharmacology and member of the Scientific Board of the Intellectual Property Office at UNIFESP. Also, she completed her pharmacy and biochemistry degree at the State University of Londrina in Paraná. And she received her PhD at UNIFESP and postdoctoral fellowship in molecular biology at Butantan Institute, which is a, which is a Brazilian institution mostly renowned by the scientific research with venomous animal and production of vaccines. Also, Professor uh, Hayashi is extensively involved in medical and biomedical education and is also active in multiple research endeavors, which primarily aim to characterize the association between oligopeptides and oligopeptidases and mental disorders, notably with focus on its influence in cognitive function and general symptoms. Her work broadly aims to characterize the underlying causes of mental disorders, notably schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, pursuing the neurodevelopmental hypothesis and the importance of inflammation to explain the dual influence of genetic background and environment for the susceptibility to mental disorders. This body of work has provided up to now a platform for identifying novel molecular biomarkers for diagnosis and potential new targets to treat and prevent mental disorders. Dr. Professor Miro Hayashi has published more than 90 scientific articles on mental disorders and natural compounds for drug discovery field, besides several chapters of books and patents applications field. Dr. Hash was recently awarded with the prize for Fleury Group Innovation Award, thanks to the development of a method of identifying biomarkers for severe mental illness by nuclear magnet resonance and chemometrics protected by the patent field uh, and regulated here in, in UNIFESB. So, Professor Miron Hayash, it's a, a pleasure to have you here. And Professor Richard Lee, thank you so much again for taking your time to be here with us. And Professor Miron Hayash will introduce to you and will uh, give all the instructions for the attendants to optimize your time and your moment here. So thank you so much. And UNIFESP, we welcome you and say thank you for being here today with us. Thank you, Camilo for the long and great introduction. So I would like to introduce now uh, Dr. Richard Lee. He's actually assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University. He obtained a BS in bio biomedical engineering at Homeward campus in Johns Hopkins University. He obtained PhD in molecular biology and genetics, and his postdoctoral training was in the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. 
for graduate school, Dr. D was trained under the epigenetics Dr. Andrew Fember, where his research focused on uncovering epigenetic mechanisms that underlie genomic imprinting and childhood development disorders. Dr. Lee then received his postdoctoral training under Dr. James Potash, currently the chairman of Psychiatry at John Hopkins, and he has been applying tools and methods of epigenetic studies to date the mechanism by which stress exposure can affect genes and pathways involved in psychiatric disorders. He also worked with collaborators to understand epigenetic mechanisms associated with drugs of abuse, psycho psychotropic medications, and motivation behavior. And I hope that we can also uh, straighten our connection and start some um, successful scientific collaboration. So I would like to thank you very much, Richard, for your uh, for attending, for accepting my invitation, and also for the audience. And before you start, I just would like to ask the audience to make the questions um, by the chat. And I suppose to translate those that cannot uh, um, express in English. So uh, you can write in Portuguese if necessary, and then I will try to translate Richard. So we are planning to have one hour of presentation by Dr. Richard, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions and discussions. Okay? So thank you very much, Richard, and the screen is yours. Okay, thank you so much for uh, the invitation. I'm thankful for the uh, UNOFESP institution and uh, Dr. Hayashi for uh, for the uh, generous uh, invitation. Um, as mentioned uh, today, I will talk about the role, role of the HPA axis and the neuroendocrine system in psychiatric uh, disorders. Um, I will, I guess, I will talk to you briefly about uh, what what stress is. Uh, it, it's a, a lot of different things, but. Uh, Mainly, I will be talking to you about psychosocial stress and how it uh, contributes to uh, psychiatric disorders. Uh, and uh, to fully understand how stress can lead to uh, psychiatric disorders, uh, we need a brief discussion on a field called epigenetics. So I will talk to you um, for a little bit on epigenetics and some of the uh, different flavors of epigenetics, different mechanisms, and some of the tools that we use in epigenetics. And I will then switch gears to talk to you about how epigenetics pertains to uh, stress and psychiatric disorders. And the second half of my presentation, I will talk to you about some of the case studies uh, that were mostly done by uh, the group here as well as uh, by other groups looking at uh, epigenetics and human behavior and animal models as it pertains to psychiatry. Uh, and I'll have some afterthoughts on how HPA axis is involved in uh, some of the uh, substance abuse disorders such as alcoholism and uh, uh, drug abuse. Um, so let's get started. What is stress? Uh, stress is uh, has been originally defined by uh, Hans Selye uh, in 1936, and it's defined as a nonspecific response of the body to any demand for change. And it's a very general uh, uh, statement, uh, but over you know, 80 or so years, uh, we've learned a great deal about uh, you know, the uh, physiological response to stress and what stress is made of. Now, uh, stress for the most part is made up of, uh, or the stress response is made up of two components. One is the autonomic nervous system, the uh, sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems that, you know, pre in pre initiate or precipitate the stress response and then kind of uh, returns the body back to normal. But of greater interest to me is the HPA axis. So this is a much longer impact on uh, physiology than uh, the autonomic uh, nervous uh, system. Uh, so the HPA axis consists of the hypothalamus, uh, the pituitary, and the adrenal glands uh, that through uh, neuroendocrine communication uh, mounts the stress response. And the endpoint of the HPA axis being activated uh, is the release of cortisol or the stress hormone. 
And I will also refer to uh, cortisol as a glucocorticoid, which is the kind of a general term for uh, these uh, stress hormones. And so uh, starting from uh, um, the brain, the hypothalamus here in the red circle, uh, you have the perception of stress and release of the corticotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus to the pituitary below. Um, and from the pituitary uh, through intracellular uh, signaling, as well as uh, physiological response, there's the release of adrenal corticotropic hormone, which when it re uh, reaches the adrenal glands, so these are the glands on top of the kidneys, uh, release cortisol. So let me talk to you a little bit about uh, psycho stress, psychosocial stress as an environmental factor. So I think I had to think about this a little bit because stress uh, is very different from some of the other environmental factors. You know, when we think of, you know, diet or exposure to lead or other toxicants and even uh, uh, ion, ionizing radiation, you know, from, uh, you know, nuclear power plants uh, or from, you know, uh, sources of radiation from outer space. Uh, so in these cases, in these instances of environmental factors, you're actually uh, physically or chemically exposed to these uh, external factors. But psychosocial stress is a little bit different because it is not something that's directly physically affecting you. It is your perception of stress that initiates this physiological response. And it can be very subjective. So there's a uh, stress test called a tree or social stress test where, uh, you know, participants go in front of a large group of people and either they, you know, uh, do some sort of a uh, public speaking engagement uh, or uh, solve, uh, you know, I guess difficult uh, mathematical problems. And so when you're in front of a group of people and you're tasked with, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, problems, uh, it could be very stressful. So then your, you know, autonomic uh, system kicks in, your sympathetic system kicks in, and then your HPA axis uh, gets involved and there's a uh, release of copious amounts of cortisol. And I say it's subjective because, you know, I could easily picture a, um, you know, a math teacher, uh, some, like a calculus teacher going in front of the same group of people uh, which, you know, uh, he or she does every day uh, during school and solve uh, relatively difficult uh, problems with ease. So then she or he would not have such a, a strong stress response. So it is, it can be very subjective. And of course, uh, the stress response is triggered even if no actual harm has occurred. And this is very different from, you know, the stress response that, uh, that we normally encountered, you know, through uh, you know, through evolution, you know, uh, life of an animal being chased by a predator, you know, it's either life or death, right? And so um, uh, th there is actual uh, potential for harm. Uh, and, and But in this day and age, you know, a lot of our stressors are psychosocial in nature. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it is an environmental factor because it is through our interaction with the environment that uh, the stress response uh, is precipitated. Uh, so this is the acute stress response system that involves the autonomic nervous system. So, you know, when you're first uh, initiating the, you know, what's called a fight or flight response, you know, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, you know, there's heavy breathing, you know, and this is to mobilize uh, your energy sources to uh, tackle the uh, stressor. Um, uh, you know, whether it's evading a prey or uh, running away from uh, a, a, a robber or um, avoiding a car accident. But these are all physiological responses that are very short uh, in duration and for the purpose of uh, evading a, uh, an obstacle. Um, so uh, I... Uh, am uh, indebted to the work by uh, Bruce McEwen, who's I consider, I guess, the father of uh, uh, modern day stress, as well as uh, work from uh, Robert Sapolsky, uh, who's uh, spent a lifetime uh, working uh, and understanding the stress response. Um, the problem with uh, 
stress is that in, in this day and age, uh, uh, stress becomes very chronic. Uh, and so we have what's called allostatic load. So this is the cumulative wear and tear on the body uh, through repeated exposure to stress and uh, repeated activation of the HPA axis. And so some of the uh, mechanisms that existed to uh, mount a quick uh, acute stress response is now uh, turned on uh, chronically. And so you have you know, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, uh, susceptibility to cancer. And of course, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, the cortisol does is to uh, suppress your immune system. So you have a susceptibility to infection. Uh, you have obesity and diabetes and so forth. Um, and of great uh, interest to me, of course, uh, working in the Department of Psychiatry are uh, psychiatric disorders that are uh, often associated as uh, consequences of chronic stress exposure. So there are uh, sources of these uh, psychosocial stress. Like, as I mentioned, we work in the post-industrial age, you know, uh, the work environment with the social hierarchy, you know, the boss that uh, constantly is demanding more work from you, the morning commute of getting stuck in traffic or having to meet deadlines. There's relationships that uh, we're in, whether family or, you know, uh, for spouses. Um, there's financial economic hardship. Uh, I think a lot of us uh, are uh, have entered that kind of uh, extra economic hardship because of the current status that we're in. Uh, for kids, there's bullying at school. And then we have the pandemic. And there are lots of people that are socially isolated as a result. And that is a, surprisingly, um, that is a potent stressor, uh, which I will uh, talk about later. And then, of course, uh, in the past four years, we had the uh, elected leadership. You know, uh, you know, I, I added the phrase, uh, make America boring again, because I think that government should be very boring, that you shouldn't have to think about them, uh, think about the way the government works. But, you know, unfortunately, in the past several years, uh, you know, there's always something going on that made headline news. Uh, so it was very stressful for uh, many of the uh, uh, Americans, at least. Um, and uh, changing gears real quick, let me uh, explain to you how uh, stress hormone works. So uh, as I show, as I've shown you before, the stress hormone itself, when it's released into the body, is based on um, a modification from cholesterol. And cholesterol being uh, hydrophobic, it readily goes right through your uh, cell membrane. And what happens is when it goes through the cells, it initiates a series of uh, molecular reactions. And so, you know, I'm gonna get uh, quite technical here, but the, uh, uh, the cortisol uh, binds to a receptor called a glucocorticoid receptor, and it's usually tethered in a uh, complex of proteins. And upon binding, it separates from that complex, it dimerizes, and then it uh, has some additional uh, work uh, signaling function in the cytoplasm of the cells, but also uh, one of the main things that it does is it uh, goes into the nucleus of the cell where it binds to specific uh, sequences of DNA uh, called the glucocorticoid response element or the GRE. And as a result, there are uh, genes that are either turned on or turned off and that uh, initiates uh, at the intracellular level, the uh, stress response. Um, and one of the uh, many genes that are uh, made or into mRNA uh, is a gene called, uh, or a protein called FKBP5, which I will talk uh, extensively uh, throughout this talk because it's one of the uh, few genes that I'm very interested in because of its role in psychiatric disorders. So to get into detail about how stress and stress hormone um, is associated with, with psychiatric disorders, I got into this because I, you know, working in the Department of Psychiatry, I'm not a clinician. And so, uh, you know, it was very difficult for me to understand some of the uh, psychiatric disorders. And uh, for me to actually kind of understand uh, at least some uh, mechanism of how uh, psychiatric 
disorder such as depression or bipolar disorder is precipitated, I thought, you know, as a molecular biologist, ah, there's stress, which is a very uh, robust risk factor for a lot of these disorders. And uh, dysregulation of the stress response, it turns out through, you know, literature search is associated with, you know, anxiety disorder, PTSD, with uh, depression, bipolar disorder. And one of the wonderful things about stress hormone is that you could actually measure it in the blood of, uh, even in saliva, actually, of uh, uh, humans and, uh, and so forth. So to be specific, what does uh, stress hormone or glucocorticoids uh, do in psychiatric disorders, it turns out that uh, excess levels of cortisol and uh, the resulting glucocorticoid resistance, so this is when your body doesn't respond well to uh, cortisol signaling, it's often comorbid with depression. In fact, I think about 50% of the cases of depression, uh, patients with depression have uh, this phenomenon where they have high levels of cortisol uh, in their plasma. Um, and it, working in the Department of Psychiatry, it, it turns out that I learned that uh, glucocorticoids are one of the few molecules that could actually trigger both mania and depression uh, in bipolar uh, disorder. And one of the um, diseases that I had the opportunity to work with is a rare disease called Cushing's disease. So this is where you have a uh, tumor in the pituitary uh, normal usually uh, that releases, uh, you know, as I mentioned to you before, ACTH then goes to the adrenal gland and so releases a uh, copious amount of uh, cortisol in these patients. And it turns out that about, you know, 60 to 80 percent of these patients have uh, depression and anxiety disorders. Uh, and what's, uh, I, I guess, what's uh, insightful about this disease is that when you, you know, surgically cure them or biochemically cure their condition, you know, by removing the tumor, uh, the pituitary tumor, or, uh, uh, you know, giving them um, uh, Google corticoid receptor antagonists to block their, you know, uh, hormone signaling, their depressive symptoms are actually resolved. So you see this nice cause and effect relationship between uh, high levels of cortisol and the development of uh, psychiatric symptoms. Um, as I, and I mentioned to you before, uh, social isolation is a potent stressor because it turns out that, you know, you know we are social creatures uh, by design and, uh, you know, being alone for a very long time is very stressful, uh, not only for us, obviously, but for uh, animals that live in societies. Uh, to, I guess, to uh, think about, um, some of the relevant studies that have been done regarding the role of stress on disease, uh, I would like to point you to uh, the Whitehall studies uh, done by, done by uh, Marmot et al. Um, in uh, in the 1960s and 1980s. Uh, so this is these are two studies of uh, British civil servants. Uh, so they have a uh, the you know, I don't know about now, but at least, I mean, they probably do right now too, because the, uh, we have this kind of system as well, but there are different grades or levels of employment uh, for uh, government workers. So these two studies, uh, one uh, looked at about 17,000 uh, employees in the British civil servant system uh, for the first study, and then about 10,000 uh, for the second study in the 1980s. And what they examined was looking at, uh, I mean, they looked at uh, coronary heart disease and you know, disease mortality and compared that to employment grade level. So um, what they found was kind of uh, astonishing because it turned out that uh, the employment grade level, so what level of uh, employment uh, or authority or you know, the totem pole they like to say here, uh, what level your employment grade was uh, has had the strongest predictor than any other uh, risk factor for coronary heart disease. Um, so those at the lower end of the uh, the servant system had higher incidence of uh, coronary heart disease and mortality than ones in the high in the higher up in the chain. And then the um, the Whitehall study too, the second study also examined psychosocial factors and they found 
uh, an exact same uh, relationship as well, where they looked at you know work environment, social support, and financial difficulties, um, all having a an inverse relationship with grade level. So this was a very large study, basically looking at uh, uh, looking at job strain or you know psychosocial stress and the um, in, employment uh, grade. And it goes to show that uh, there are a slew of these uh, disorders that are associated with uh, increase in stress levels. And to be more specific, uh, not only the um, stress, but looking at just the stress hormone itself, uh, cortisol or you know, generically uh, glucocorticoids, there was even a bigger study uh, that was performed in 2012 looking at uh, over a hundred, over several hundred thousand uh, patients that were given uh, corticosteroids or, you know, basically cortisol for uh, diseases, uh, autoimmune diseases, you know, such as uh, arthritis, asthma, uh, lupus, and so forth. Um, now, these are non-psychiatric uh, uh, diseases. And so they compared basically, uh, you know, several hundred thousand patients who were given um, these medications uh, for uh, these specific disorders and uh, to others that did not receive these uh, hormones. And what they found was a uh, significant uh, increase in the prevalence of uh, depression, or do they call it uh, hazard ratio, uh, you know, mania, panic disorder, and suicidal behavior. So this was a very powerful study because you're looking at in the human population, you know, of several hundred thousand participants, a significant relationship between stress hormone uh, at, uh, exposure and uh, psychiatric disorders. So looking at some of these uh, studies in literature, uh, I started looking at uh, some of these genes or proteins that are involved in uh, cortisol or glucocorticoid signaling. And so this was one of the early uh, kind of revelations I had, my small revelation, uh, just uh, listing all of these genes uh, that are involved in glucocorticoid signaling. And either in uh, humans or animal models, there's a uh, abundance of uh, uh, evidence for their role in uh, psychiatric disorders. So now we're kind of getting into the, uh, the mechanism of things, uh, linking uh, stress hormone exposure and uh, some of these uh, disorders that are involved with, associated with chronic exposure. So kind of the framework that I have is that you have environmental stressors, activation of uh, the HPA axis, and then you also have Iatrogenic glucocorticoid administration, so you know, uh, for um, you know, asthma or uh, arthritis, you have uh, doctors, uh, clinicians providing uh, sources of uh, cortisol to the patients. And so, when you have high levels of cortisol, uh, it turns on basically glucocorticoid signaling in the tissues and cells. And what you get are altered. Uh, uh, cortisol homeostasis, so your homeostatic levels of uh, stress hormone is, becomes altered, you know, it could be through uh, genetics. So you have risk factors for how your body responds to uh, cortisol signaling. And then you have epigenetics, which is what I will talk to you about. So this is kind of an interaction with the uh, environment, in this case, exposure to stress and stress hormone. And then you also have uh, protein modifications that occur as a result of uh, Google corticoid or cortisol signaling, which uh, um, has not been studied as well, but it's definitely important for uh, infection. And then through these modifications in the tissues and cells, uh, you have multiple um, symptoms or disorders that are precipitated. So let me explain to you or uh, switch gears and I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, briefly about epigenetics. And I think that, um, just to highlight some of the interesting case studies linking, uh, you know, stress or glucocorticoid exposure to uh, psychiatric disorders, I'll, I will kind of speed through them. So epigenetics 
is the study of uh, heritable changes in gene function um, that does not involve uh, changes in DNA sequence. And so for the most part, it involves the uh, structural modification inside the cell that kind of promotes or determines whether a gene is turned on or turned off. And so I'll talk to you briefly about the three main uh, flavors of epigenetics. I, I think there's probably another one that's uh, emerging soon or has been emerging. One is DNA methylation. These are modifications on specific uh, sequences of DNA. And then there's histone modifications. Um, so this, these are uh, proteins that the DNA is wrapped around and they're modified to uh, change ac accessibility to uh, specific pieces of DNA. And then there are non-coding RNAs. So these are your microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs that uh, play a role in regulating gene function. And uh, as I mentioned to you before, none of these involve uh, changes in uh, you know, underlying uh, genetic sequence or mutations. And so this is DNA methylation. Uh, it's a um, methyl group that gets attached for the most part to cytosine. So we call it CPG because it's in the context of cytosine and a guanine um, where a methyl group gets attached to the fifth carbon um, of cytosine. And basically a general way to think of DNA methylation is that when, you know, for instance, in a cancer, in a tumor suppressor gene, you know, the promoter region is usually unmethylated um, to uh, to check cell growth. So, you know, these kind of white lollipops here represent unmethylated CEGs. And then uh, through, you know, a poor diet or exposure to some uh, mutagen, you know, you have um, methylation of this promoter region of a tumor suppressor gene indicated by uh, these black lollipops. And so then what happens is the gene is not turned on and you uh, when you have uh, suppression of a uh, tumor suppressor gene, um, repression of a tumor suppressor gene, uh, you know, the uh, cell growth is unchecked and you, you know, get uh, carcinogenesis. Um, there are other flavors of DNA methylation. Uh, in the past, I think about five or six years, uh, DNA hydroxymethylation is another uh, relevant modification. It's very uh, prevalent, actually, in uh, in the brain. So. Uh, there has been uh, an increasing number of studies looking at hydroxymethylation in uh, psychiatric disorders and behavior. Um, histone modifications, um, uh, there, in, about 20 years ago, there's uh, um, a very influential review paper uh, um, uh, calling all the modifications the histone code, uh, where basically some of the lysines and um, uh, other amino acids become, uh, you know, uh, covalently modified uh, by different enzymes. So you can see a whole slew of these enzymes that modify histones. So histones, as I mentioned to you before, are uh, these kind of drum-like uh, protein complexes where the DNA is wrapped around and it's, uh, you know, compacting the DNA, approximately two meters of DNA into uh, every single cell. So it's a way of uh, uh, condensing uh, a lot of this genetic material that we call DNA into a very small space. Um, and how that is important, in, obviously, in epigenetics is that these modifications are uh, recognized by specific enzymes that uh, basically ultimately uh, change the structure of uh, the way the DNA is wrapped around. So then there's accessible uh, so they have accessibility to, you know, transcription factors or uh, and repressors and so on that could turn on and turn off uh, specific genes. And then you have uh, microRNAs or long non-coding RNAs that I mentioned to you before. They work at the, uh, sometimes at the DNA level, but also at, uh, for microRNAs, they work at the RNA level to silence uh, 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 translation, basically. Uh, they interfere with, uh, you know, messenger RNAs from becoming uh, proteins uh, by binding to the tail end of some of these mRNAs. And then long non-coding RNAs also play a role in uh, uh, exon activation. So there's plenty of uh, epigenetic mechanisms uh, aside from environmental factors um, that play a role in normal physiology. So you, we have exon inactivation in, in females. One of the X chromosome is inactivated through epigenetic mechanisms. Uh, there's 
cell differentiation, uh, you know, with stem cells differentiating into, you know, you know kidney cells or uh, liver cells. So they need to undergo uh, lots of reprogramming, not necessarily changes in, not necessarily, but, or no changes in DNA sequence, but they need to change uh, their programming to, uh, from being stem cells to uh, cells that are specialized to uh, a specific tissue. So then uh, epigenetic mechanisms are involved and, you know, a, a, um, a branching off of cell differentiation is cancer is when you have abnormal differentiation or poor differentiation of cells. Uh, and, and of course, reprogramming um, of uh, uh, their replication potential uh, that involves epigenetic mechanisms as well. There's genomic imprinting, uh, depending on uh, whether the you know a piece of DNA is from your father or the mother. There's uh, they're turned on or off. So there's uh, genomic imprinting disorders where uh, epigenetics uh, goes awry, and uh, you have you know silencing of both genes or. Uh, turning on of uh, both parental uh, genes, and then you have disease. And then, of course, uh, in, in, in terms of interacting with the environment, there's exposure to environmental toxicants. Lead is supposed to be a very potent uh, 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 toxicant for neurodevelopment, even in low doses. So, uh, you know, lead apparently, um, so I'm kind of learning about some of these uh, environmental toxicants as well, they interfere with some of the epigenetic machinery like DNA methyltransferases to change methylation patterns across the genome. And when that happens in the brain, you know, uh, you get neurodevelopmental issues. And then there are, you know, psychotropic medications and of course, uh, stress. And so, you know, uh, epigenetic tools, um, I will briefly uh, uh, mention to you are, um, you know, the tools that have been developed, you know, in the past several decades to understand or detect and identify some of these uh, epigenetic mechanisms. So there's DNA methylation detection, histone modifications, and then there's you know, ways of looking at specific uh, 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 regions for epigenetic changes, uh, let's say from stress. And then there are methods now with, you know, with the deep sequencing or next generation sequencing to be able to uh, sequence across the genome to detect epigenetic modifications. And then um, one of the uh, very important tools of epigenetics, of course, is that we need to uh, have a method of uh, isolating very specific cell types. Uh, this is important because unlike genetics, where you know you can get your genomic DNA from, you know, from your saliva or from your blood uh, or your, from your skin, for the most part, uh, the genetic sequence is identical, but epigenetic patterns, of course, depending on whether you know the cell came from you know the brain, you know, in, even in the brain from you know neurons or the supporting you know glial cells, or you know from the liver or the kidney, all of the DNA sequence is identical for the most part, but you know uh, epigenetic patterns are very different depending on uh, their uh, cellular programming. Um, so we use a uh, uh, platform called fluorescence activated cell sorting. So it's a it's a fancy way of labeling specific cell types using antibodies and you know fluorescent molecules to separate out uh, different uh, types of cells, and then you could use those cells for epigenetic analysis. And so for detecting uh, DNA, there's uh, quite a few methods, like such as using enzymes and so forth. But we use bisulfite conversion. So you have uh, basically, uh, cytosines that, in the absence of methylation, turn to thymines, um, and then if it's methylated, it stays as a uh, cytosine. So you can see here, when it's methylated, it stays as a C, and then when it's unmethylated, it's converted to a, a T. And you could see here also that the, some of the other uh, Cs that are not in the context of a CG are also uh, changed. So it's a uh, <coughs> excuse me. Since you already know the uh, underlying sequence, when you look at uh, the bisulfite converted uh, DNA, uh, so this is from uh, using uh, sodium bisulfite, when you bisulfite treat and convert the DNA and you sequence this piece of DNA, you could tell whether previously it was methylated or unmethylated. And then um, I'll, I'll skip this part, but there are uh, very quantitative methods of uh, assessing whether a specific CG in a uh, uh, piece of DNA is um, 
uh, you know, uh, methylated or, un or unmethylated, but when you have a pool of DNA, uh, there's a method called pyrosequencing that gives you a very, uh, uh, I guess, highly quantitative method of detect detecting uh, methylation. Um, and this is pyrosequencing. Um, it's a uh, quantitative machine. And then there are histone modifications where, you know, you cross-link DNA and you pull down uh, DNA associated with these histones, and then you have antibodies against histones, uh, 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 specific histone modifications, and then you could sequence the DNA that came down with it to see whether uh, a piece of DNA is, you know, modified uh, or associated with a specifically modified uh, uh, histone, uh, a piece of histone protein. Uh, this is important because then you could get a, a across the, you know, if you do this across the genome uh, called chip seq, you could actually get a, a sense of uh, which regions of the DNA are, you know, associated with compacted uh, histones and other ones are open for transcription. Um, so this is the next generation platform where instead of looking at a specific region, you could just fragment your entire genomic DNA as I, um, uh, with uh, for DNA methylation or with histone modifications, and then you know through different uh, isolation methods. Uh, in this case, you label specific regions with a uh, a, a, a RNA probe that's uh, uh, attached to uh, uh, magnetic beads. You could actually pull out specific areas across the genome, and then uh, you know make what are called sequencing libraries to sequence them. Um, so this is. A, um, uh, a particular uh, methylation sequencing that uh, we've done for the mouse uh, genome. Um, and what you get at the end are kind of these uh, list of genes. So in, in this particular study here, uh, we looked at, uh, you know, DNA methylation changes that occur in mice um, that were uh, treated with stress hormone and then the other ones are treated, other group was treated with uh, vehicle. And so then uh, we basically isolate, uh, you know, genomic DNA from both of these groups, uh, make these what, what are called sequencing libraries. And then uh, uh, after sequencing these libraries, you know, we separate them out into two groups and say, ask the question, what are the areas with the biggest uh, DNA methylation differences? Uh, and so at the end, you have this kind of list of uh, regions uh, and the names of genes uh, that are um, that that show the biggest uh, methylation difference between the treated and uh, the cortisol treated and vehicle treated animals, and then you get a nice picture of some of these regions and what they look like. Uh, so these gray bars are the CGs, and then these uh, blue dots are the uh, the vehicle treated animals, uh, and then the red dots are the uh, cortisol treated animals. And you can see I fairly uh, significant difference in methylation at some of these regions. And then uh, unlike some of the uh, studies where you look at one or two genes, if you look at you know, many genes across the genome, in this case, we looked at you know, prob probably uh, over 10,000 genes uh, or regions uh, of genes across the genome, you could then uh, identify what these genes are and what pathways they might be involved in. So then you could uh, look in, you know, you could do like what's called a pathway analysis in blood uh, and in the brain. And you could see in both of these cases, the similar uh, types of pathways that are implicated from uh, cortisol treatment. Um, as I mentioned to you before, uh, you know, there are some obstacles in psychiatry uh, when it comes, comes to doing epigenetic analysis. And so this plays right into kind of uh, the need for uh, biomarkers. Um, and so, uh, you know, in introduction to uh, 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 Dr. Hayashi, uh, you know, she's involved in, you know, looking at biomarkers of, uh, you know, schizophrenia. Um, and so, you know, I think epigenetics also, uh, we are in need of, uh, uh, biomarkers when it comes to uh, psychiatric disorders. And in, in doing so, we have several obstacles. One is, you know, tissue heterogeneity. Of course, we're interested in the brain, but as I mentioned to you before, uh, depending on whether it's brain or the uh, supporting glial cells, there are specific and different epigenetic signatures. And then, of course, 
why why do we need biomarkers? It's because some of the tissues that uh, that we are interested in, where you know the disease is occurring, is not accessible. You know, I mean, you could. I've done some work with uh, postmortem brain tissues, but you know, in in these cases, you know, the uh, the patients are already dead, and you know, you're trying to identify you know uh, some sort of disease relevant signatures in these brain tissues, but to really help uh, the patient population, you need biomarkers of um, you know things that are occurring in the brain while the patient is alive, right? So then you need uh, biomarkers, um, peripheral biomarkers, uh, because the brain is inaccessible for the most part. And um, some of the obstacles that we have with biomarkers uh, and of course with epigenetics in psychiatry is that there are lots of confounding factors. So we have age, sex, and medication, you know, comorbidities, all of these affect epigenetic signatures. Um, well, not only when you're looking at it just for uh, epigenetic modifications, but of course, as uh, biomarker potentials. You know, we know that uh, for those of you who are familiar with epigenetics, we know that uh, there's a large epigenetic change that occurs as you age, and there are differences in epigenetics between males and females. And then, of course, medications uh, cause um, epigenetics as well. Uh, epigenetic changes as well. Um, and this is what I mentioned to you before about obtaining a uh, homogeneous population of cells. Uh, in particular, you can see here, this is uh, from a brain tissue uh, of uh, Alzheimer's disease patients. And for the sake of demonstration, I went through and looked at a specific gene uh, that's specific for the glia. And then I separated out basically uh, DNA from uh, neurons versus the glial cells. And you can see here, uh, the y-axis is percent methylation. And then these are uh, on the x-axis, the different uh, positions uh, C of CGs. So there are seven CGs that are consecutive. Um, I'm looking at methylation by power sequencing of, uh, you know, in blue neuronal cells and then with uh, glial cells. And you can see a world of difference. Uh, uh, in epigenetic uh, modification, and it's coming from a same uh, coming from the same block of tissue where I, you know, you you cut it out from you know the postmortem brain, and then and then you process it further to identify these uh, or to uh, isolate these two uh, species of uh, cell types. Uh, so. Other than I guess, in addition to uh, stress, there are lots of uh, evidence for the role of epigenetics in psychiatry. Uh, we have you know, my, monozygotic twins. They're, they're, some of them are uh, discordant for uh, psychiatric disorders. And then we have uh, onset of illness uh, for in adolescence for some of these disorders like depression and uh, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. They, you don't see uh, cases of these disorders as much uh, in our early childhood compared to, you know, adolescence and young adulthood and so forth, right? And there's also the episodic nature of illnesses like bipolar disorders. They have, uh, uh, you know, they cycle through, you know, depression and mania. And so then there are uh, presumed to be epigenetic uh, factors that are involved. And then, of course, there's uh, the relationship to environmental factors. Uh, uh, present to you some of the uh, case studies uh, briefly about some of these um, uh, instances. And then, uh, you know, even mechanism of action of uh, medications, you know, you know, now we have, you know, ketamine and psilocybin, which are thought to be uh, or shown to be uh, rapid acting uh, antidepressants, but some of the other medications take a long time uh, for to achieve their therapeutic effect. And uh, it's it, it's it has been thought that you know it takes a while for some of these uh, medications to actually cause long-lasting changes, uh, uh, possibly through epigenetic modifications. Uh, so these are some of the examples of where epigenetics is involved in the stress response. Uh, uh, one of the probably the most important things I found uh, working with uh, animal models of stress uh, and even cell lines is that. Uh, Exposure to stress hormone can directly uh, change uh, DNA methylation. So it's other people have looked at histone modifications, but I've focused mainly on DNA methylation because the uh, 
changes in DNA methylation to stress hormone uh, is, is very profound, as I show, uh, as I will show in the um, uh, next slides. So I focus on a gene called FKBP5. If you remember, uh, oh, there it is. If you remember from yeah from the next slide uh, that I've shown you previously, uh, it is one of the genes that are or proteins that are involved in modulating uh, Google corticoid signaling. And it turns out that you know in the ever since one of the first uh, studies published by uh, uh, Elizabeth Bender and her group at Max Planck Institute. Uh, you know, genetics and epigenetics of FKBP5. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it's a gene that's been implicated in uh, a whole slew of psychiatric disorders, uh, you know, through uh, mood disorders, anxiety uh, disorders, and even uh, addiction as well. And here you can see why FKBP5 is so important because after you have glucocorticoid signaling and activation of uh, glucocorticoid response genes, one of the uh, genes that are transcribed is FKBP5. And so uh, what happens is when you have more of this uh, gene transcribed and translated, it acts as a intracellular negative feedback on this entire glucocorticoid signaling. So I mentioned to you before that in about 50% uh, of the cases of depression, uh, is associated with hypercortisolemia and uh, Google corticoid resistance. So this is uh, one of the mechanisms of how Google corticoid resistance is achieved in depression. It's because you have uh, high levels of FKBP5 being uh, made from, uh, you know, re I guess repeated stress exposure uh, in, in, in these cases of depression. And what it does is it blocks additional glucocorticoid or cortisol signaling. And what happens is you start accumulating lots of uh, stress hormone in the plasma. And then because of this uh, signaling, the body is no longer as sensitive to glucocorticoids or cortisol as before. And to be specific, some of these uh, genetic variants of FKBP5 are associated with uh, depression either uh, recurrence or um, uh, response to uh, antidepressant treatment. Uh, there are SNPs that are involved, actually the same SNPs uh, or you know, genetic variations uh, are involved in uh, bipolar disorder. Um, there's also you know, gene environment interaction with uh, exposure to childhood uh, adversity uh, on uh, a risk for PTSD. Uh, and so in the past, uh, probably about 10 years since uh, uh, the genetic variants in FKBP5 have been implicated in uh, psychiatric disorders, uh, it turns out that um, uh, there's been a whole slew of uh, studies, probably several hundred now, uh, that have implicated FKBP5 in uh, these various psychiatric disorders. And I think it's a testament uh, to the role that stress and the neuroendocrine system plays in the precipitation of uh, psychiatric symptoms. And so this is a small part of my work looking at epigenetic patterns. So this was, you know, you know it's a very simple experiment done in a uh, cell line. Uh, this was obviously replicated in an animal model as well, but you could see with uh, treatment with uh, stress hormone, in this case, CORT, or, you know, corticosterone for the rodent version of uh, the stress hormone cortisol, you could see here that, uh, Animals that are treated for about four weeks show, uh, you know, I guess different increases in the expression levels of this gene. And then when you take away the hormone during the recovery period, uh, you know, expression goes down to normal. But then when you have, um, uh, when you're looking at DNA methylation patterns, so this is percent DNA methylation in the Y axis, and during the uh, treatment with uh, um, stress hormones, uh, so this is, I'm sorry, this is in a cell line treated for seven days with stress hormone. We've also done the uh, work with mice for four weeks. Um, you can see here a gradual decrease in methylation. Um, and even when you take away the uh, stress hormone from the media, you can see that the methylation persists. And so the, and then in figure C is a negative control region that is not responsive to uh, uh, stress hormone, meaning that it's, it doesn't have a binding site for the uh, glucocorticoid receptor. Um, 
So what this tells me, and also what the animal work that I've done that complements this, what this tells me is that, you know, the expression levels uh, may go back to baseline after treatment with uh, stress hormone, but the epigenetics, uh, epigenetic modifications persist. And how is that important in psychiatric disorders, uh, especially when it comes to stress, is that in the, in the bottom panel here, is that if you have normal methylation and you are um, treating the cells with stress hormone, there's an increase in the expression level of this gene. But when you've had previous exposure so that your methylation levels are already decreased, second exposure to a uh, stressor has a even more robust response to this gene. So, so uh, the first exposure, I mean, this, in this case, it's a cell line, but you could actually think of it in terms of a stressful, stressful exposure during, let's say, childhood. And in the brain, especially when it's you know, undergoing maturation and development, you could see that there's uh, long lasting, persistent epigenetic damage being done so that later on, when you're exposed to another stressor, your cellular response, in this case, uh, affecting glucocorticoid signaling actually uh, is more robust. And this is, um, I, this is a little bit complicated, so I'll just kind of go, uh, just br briefly summarize. What this shows is that the methylation change, so this was in a uh, article that was uh, published actually last month in epigenetics uh, you know, by my group. What this shows is that uh, the ability to undergo uh, stress-caused stress uh, epigenetic change um, is dependent on replication. So this is kind of consistent with what's, uh, what has been uh, known as the Barker hypothesis. So this is when, uh, this was uh, basically uh, stating that uh, conditions in utero, you know, when you're uh, in the womb, the, you know, uh, the uh, amount of nutrients and calories that are available for your development in the womb actually has a uh, impact on, uh, you know, metabolic disorders later on in life. But in this case, this might actually explain, uh, you know, in the context of psychiatric disorders, you know, the importance of the prenatal uh, environment and for consequences uh, later on in life um, during adulthood. So to, in a nutshell, in summary, what uh, happens when you lose uh, DNA methylation uh, with stress hormone exposure in the FKBP5 gene is that in panel A, you have acute exposure. So you have glucocorticoid receptor binding to this region. And you can see here, there's varied uh, methylation uh, status across this area uh, bound by some of these uh, transcription factors. And then, you know, that turns the, uh, the gene on, in this case, FKBP5. But the strength of the transcription is rather weak. On the other hand, if you've had repeated exposure or you had chronic exposure to stress, uh, either early on or even uh, as an adult, you could see here that the uh, methylation levels are uh, decreased or the, or the areas become demethylated. So you have loss of some of these uh, uh, factors. In this case, in this, this is a uh, repressor called uh, MECP2 that's involved in Rett syndrome. Uh, but these uh, very important neurodevelopmental proteins uh, recognize methylated CPGs or CGs. And then when it's unmethylated due to stress hormone exposure, uh, it's no longer bound. And so then your transcription um, is, is actually, uh, of, of FKBP5 is actually much more robust. So thinking about, um, the role that FKBP5 plays in psychiatric disorders and the need for uh, possible biomarker um, development, we've uh, started to look at the role of uh, some of these epigenetic patterns as potential biomarkers. So one of the things that we did was to uh, look to see whether a uh, epigenetic patterns that we uh, detect in the blood could actually predict 
some of the uh, processes in the brain. But first, we wanted to see if it correlates to any of the other symptoms of uh, glucocorticoid or cortisol exposure. And so what we did with animal models is that we uh, wanted to look to see whether uh, methylation levels actually correlated with a month uh, worth of uh, stress hormone exposure in the animals. And so we uh, did several correlation uh, analysis where we looked at, you know, the plasma cortisol level. So this is a, uh, each dot represents an animal and it's a summation of all the different times that we took uh, hormone measurements from their blood uh, and compared that to uh, DNA methylation patterns at the end of that treatment period. And so you can see a fairly strong correlation between uh, stress hormone levels um, during that period and the methylation level at the end. Uh, so this is uh, for two CPGs. And then we also looked at uh, DNA, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for FKBP5 expression. And then um, we could look at some of the other uh, parameters that are affected by uh, chronic stress hormone exposure, such as organ weights of the thymus of the adrenal glands. We looked at spleen weight and uh, visceral fat. So remember from uh, chronic stress hormone exposure, there's you know, uh, uh, changes that occur at the periphery, uh, such as obesity and diabetes and so forth. So we were confident that uh, the DNA methylation pattern that we're detecting could actually uh, reflect some of the other physiological changes occurring in these animals. And then this was actually uh, presented uh, uh, when I was uh, at Sao Paulo uh, several years ago, I think it was 2014. Um, looking at the correlation between DNA methylation and some of the processes that are occurring in the brain. So in this case, um, we're look at, looking at DNA methylation of uh, the FKBP5 area against you know, gene expression in the hippocampus, as well as uh, 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 DNA methylation in the hippocampus. And so there was a fairly decent and significant correlation uh, between what we could get from the blood and what's uh, occurring in the brain. So then, you know, I'd like to uh, uh, present to you some of the uh, case studies that we've been working on, looking at stress hormone response in uh, the human samples, as well as some animal models. But uh, one of the things that we did was then, if we could uh, successfully detect um, methylation in the blood to predict 30 days of uh, stress hormone exposure in the uh, uh, in these animals. Can we also do that for humans? So we recruited about a uh, hundred or so uh, healthy humans. Uh, this was a very uh, uh, I guess a long endeavor, and to see whether uh, methylation levels uh, in the blood uh, could actually predict about a month of cortisol measurements uh, in about a hundred uh, participants, and we measured this by getting their uh, saliva cortisol levels morning and night consecutively for 30 days. So this was a, um, a monu I guess, a, not monumental, but it, you know, at least for me, it was, uh, it was a very difficult uh, study in collaboration with uh, Gary Wand, who's uh, the endocrinologist uh, who kind of uh, oversaw this whole project. Um, and what we found was that, you know, it's not as strong, but there's a fairly decent correlation between uh, amount of uh, stress hormone exposure or you know stress hormone that we measured in these participants and um, um, and the methylation levels. And then so then we uh, using uh, some of the deep sequencing or next generation methods that I mentioned to you previously, we then looked at some of uh, uh, regions across the genome. So this is uh, using a platform called Agilent uh, Sure Select MethylSeq platform. And we looked at about 33.7 uh, million CGs across the genome of specific regulatory regions. And you know, uh, we, we identified uh, methylation patterns that were associated with you know, 30 days of you know, emotional stress, bedtime cortisol and awakening cortisol. And we're also able to uh, come up with some of the pathways that are involved. Um, the pathways are not as uh, robust uh, in terms of analysis compared to the animal models because it's because, as I mentioned to you before, there are lots of these uh, confounding factors, I think, that really uh, reduced our signal-to-noise uh, ratio. But similar to what was done with the animals, 
you could see that there are specific regions in other areas of the genome. In this case, this is a uh, GABA receptor, one of the subunits of GABA receptor that's involved in uh, the neural transmitter systems um, that um, show differential methylation between um, you know, people with high versus low emotional stress. And then we use, as I mentioned to you before, a, a method called pyrosequencing to quantitatively and independently verify that these methylation differences were actually uh, uh, real. And then this was a uh, work done by uh, uh, Elizabeth Binder and her group, as I mentioned to you before, on the FKBP5 gene. And in this case, we are looking at the contribution of genetics. So, you know, as I mentioned to you before, the, uh, um, the epigenetics plays a big role in uh, the stress response, but there's also uh, an aspect of genetics where your genetic variations uh, can determine your susceptibility to stress-related psychiatric disorders. In this case, you could see a uh, much stronger activation of um, the FKBP5 gene if you have the risk allele in B compared to uh, the protective allele. So this was a case of um, uh, where, you know, individuals that were exposed to uh, childhood trauma and had also the risk allele showed a much higher uh, activation of FKBP5 um, compared to those that were not exposed and those also who had the uh, protective allele. And then, this was a very small study that we did uh, in cord blood samples. Remember, I told you about the uh, uh, the kind of the Barker hypothesis about the importance of the prenatal um, uh, period. Here, we looked at uh, several of the CPGs uh, important, uh, as well as the uh, uh, the risk allele. And it turns out that if uh, uh, in the cord blood DNA of uh, mothers who were exposed to or who had anxiety or depression, there was a much higher methylation level uh, in a subset of our samples that had the, uh, the risk allele compared to the protective allele. And then, uh, as I mentioned to you before, you know, st stress plays a prominent role in bipolar disorder. This was done with uh, Dr. Uh, Jenny uh, Willauer uh, from University of Iowa, looking at FKBP5 expression um, across the gene in uh, control uh, postmortem brain compared to uh, uh, postmortem bipolar samples. And you can see here there are expression differences as well as uh, methylation differences. And there's a fairly decent correlation between methylation and uh, expressions, suggesting a potential role for uh, this stress response gene in bipolar disorder. Um, this is a, uh, another fancy, I guess, uh, for me, uh, animal study that I did. Um, looking at uh, uh, directly actually modifying DNA methylation of the FKBP5 gene using uh, the gene editing uh, tool CRISPR. So, you know, that's uh, a lot of people are using these uh, uh, tools, these very powerful tools now to edit the genome, but they also have ones where instead of the uh, nuclease, they have the uh, enzyme that modifies DNA methylation or histone modifications attached uh, so that you could actually site specifically modify uh, the epigenetics of a specific region. In this case, it's the uh, basal lateral amygdala uh, that was uh, um, uh, targeted for uh, FKBP5 methylation. So we've actually introduced uh, the the Cas9 uh, DNA to DNA methyltransferase construct into these brain regions to site specifically modify uh, a region within the FKBP5 gene. And what we found was that after uh, modifications, these animals um, actually had lower levels of FKBP5 expression and they behaved differently than uh, um, the negative uh, control animals uh, in a test of uh, anxiety-like behavior on the elevated plus maze. And finally, uh, this is a uh, uh, fairly uh, recent endeavor of mine, which is to look at uh, the role of HPA axis in another psychiatric disorder, which is substance abuse. Um, I, was, I was rather surprised to find that um, 
the HPA axis uh, plays a prominent role in some of these substance uh, abuse disorders like alcoholism and you know opioid uh, use. Um, and, and it turns out that uh, these disorders are very comorbid with psychiatric disorders. It, it goes both ways. So if you look at people who have addiction, uh, uh, they often have psychiatric disorders and vice versa. And it turns out that it's because in part, these disorders share the uh, same set of genes that it turns out that they're activated by uh, the Google corticoid signaling or uh, HPA axis activation. Um, and um, one of the important things that I found through uh, looking at the literature for human studies and animal work is that when you actually get rid of their ability to mount a stress response, it significantly alters uh, their craving for drugs. So this is something that I'm you know, trying to get to the bottom of uh, probably in the next couple of years to try to see uh, how stress, what kind of role stress plays in uh, some of these uh, substance use disorders. And so I'm gonna leave you with uh, kind of a summation of what I think happens when you are chronically exposed to stress or stress hormone and how psychiatric uh, disorders uh, develop. So you have um, uh, exposure to stress hormone and um, glucocorticoids and as, as in the case with uh, the FKBP5 gene, which regulates intracellular uh, glucocorticoid signaling, you start getting alterations epigenetically with chronic exposure, right? And then that affects by affecting the intracellular, I'm sorry, by affecting the uh, 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 systemic uh, stress hormone levels, it's affecting a group of target genes that are important for disease. And so it's a kind of a cyclical uh, vicious cycle where uh, these HP axis genes, some of which uh, alter glucocorticoid signaling, such as FKBP5, and um, another gene that I study is the glucocorticoid receptor. And by altering them, they're continuing to alter the cortisol dynamics. And then when it's altered at the uh, systemic level, it's affecting specific tissue specific processes, uh, especially in this case, uh, the brain. And um, this is a kind of a rather complex um, figure uh, which outlines uh, the interconnectedness of the uh, neurotransmitter systems. So one of the things that, um, another thing that I, been working on is to see which of these uh, HPA axis regulated genes are uh, involved in uh, neurotransmitter function. It turns out there's a quite a few. There's, you know, dopamine signaling uh, like tyrosine hydroxylase. Um, there's the serotonin transporter, uh, serotonin receptor. Many of these uh, genes uh, that code, encode uh, neurotransmitter transport synthesis uh, and receptor signaling are regulated by glucocorticoid or stress hormone signaling. And because they are, uh, because these systems, these neurotransmitter systems are uh, interconnected, meaning that, you know, in uh, different regions, they have neurons that uh, project to different regions of the brain carrying different neurotransmitter systems. You can see how even uh, a dysregulation by stress of any one of these uh, neurotransmitter systems can affect other brain regions and other neurotransmitter systems. So one of the things I did not uh, cover in this um, uh, in this presentation is that there are a whole slew of these genes that are also epigenetically modified uh, by uh, repeated or chronic uh, stress hormone or stress exposure. Um, so it gives you a kind of a framework of how uh, repeated uh, or chronic stress uh, and alterations of the HPA axis leads to um, uh, psychiatric disorders. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Can you hear me? Yeah. That was awesome, the presentation.
very, very instructive and very interesting. And oh I my gosh. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions for you in the chat. And if you don't mind, I would like to start with some of them. And um, first of them, actually, I think it's a general answer. So it might give a chance for you to summarize whatever you have presented today. Yeah. But uh, you know, he's asking, in the current knowledge, what is the quality of evidence for association between a psychiatric disorder and epigenetics? Yeah, so uh, there's actually uh, a strong or quite a bit of evidence uh, between epigenetics and psychiatric disorders. Uh, even aside, even aside from uh, stress, uh, there's been a whole number of studies by different groups, uh, you know, looking at either, you know, in the postmortem brain or, uh, or, uh, you know, peripheral tissues of, uh, you know, uh, psychiatric patients, you know, you have schizophrenia, uh, uh, you know, bipolar disorder, depression, PTSD, and they have found a whole slew of uh, epigenetic modifications or epigenetic differences, you know, DNA methylation, and there's a group up in, uh, uh, I think, Mount Sinai, Akbarian, uh, is a very uh, prominent researcher in, you know, histone modifications, uh, looking at uh, postmortem brain tissues of, you know, you know, schizophrenia, and found a large amount of evidence uh, to show dysregulation of epigenetic patterns uh, in psychiatric disorders. Oh, you're, okay, you're mute. Yeah, thank you, sorry. And I would like also to complement this question with my own question. Actually, uh, I can understand the importance of those uh, DNA methylation and genetic modification that could control the expression of some specific proteins. Do you believe that it is possible to have a long-term regulation by the proteins that are expressed after DNA methylation, for example, or those that are not expressed anymore? I mean, I was thinking about a long-term response by uh, modified protein or by a uh, new status of the animal if those modification induced by cortisol or by stress. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I, I, you're like coming in and out, but I, I think I got the gist of your question. Yeah, so protein modification, um, uh, and, and, you know, since I presented this to you last year, I, I've also, you know, uh, took the opportunity to learn more about, you know, protein modifications in, uh, you know, with stress and epigenetics. And uh, there isn't uh, as much, but uh, actually found a lot of evidence for uh, the role of protein modifications uh, in psychiatric disorders as well. Um, so the glucocorticoid, uh, you know, I, I, I presented in, in one of the slides uh, earlier on uh, you know, there's role of genetics and there's, you know, epigenetics and there's protein modification. So I specifically added that because I started finding some, you know, quite a bit of evidence uh, showing that protein modification is a, another uh, uh, function that's, that's associated with the glucocorticoid signaling. So not only does the glucocorticoid receptor uh, affect, you know, gene expression and epigenetic modification, but it at the in the cytoplasm, it also helps with other cofactors to uh, phosphorylate uh, or dephosphorylate specific proteins. And then, so then these proteins uh, could go and you know uh, even in the chronic sense uh, perform whatever function that they're doing at the cellular signaling. And converse, uh, alternatively, some of these genes that are transcribed they're made into mRNA. And so this is a limitation of my research, which is, you know, because it's convenient for me, you know, to look at mRNA, uh, you know, that's what I measure. But you know very well, of course, because you work with proteins that, you know, uh, uh, that there's not a good correlation between, you know, uh, amount of mRNA and uh, proteins. So mRNA could actually disappear after a little bit, but you know, depending on the protein, they could some of the proteins could last much, much longer, right? And so, uh, in the chronic sense, I think that uh, depending on the half life of some of these proteins, they could have a long lasting effect uh, even after you know the mRNA has been degraded. 
Yeah, actually, in this case, I was wondering about your protein FPK5. I think um, I just would like if this protein could be, for example, uh, higher in expression, and then they could have a long-term effect. Because those proteins are um, controlling or modulating, regulating the uh, glycocorticoid uh, receptor, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I do some protein work, uh, usually looking at histone modifications, but I actually did look at uh, FKBP5 uh, protein levels uh, after glucocorticoid treatment. Yeah, so, you know, that, that's one example where the protein actually, uh, you know, stays around for a much longer period than the uh, mRNA transcript. Yeah, so actually I will come back to, to the chat. There is another question, it's from Joe, uh, you may know him, and he's asking that uh, since stress exposure represents a major environment risk factor for schizophrenia and other psychiatry disorders, uh, and it, HPA axis dysregulation appears a consequence of social stress, uh, but not all patients experience uh, the same kind of event. They, they are not all have psychosis. So could this axis be regulated by other factors like cytokines or LPS from the uh, microbiota? Yeah, of course. Uh... You know, so, so is the you know is he talking about the uh, the differential response to stress? Yes. Okay. okay. The variation yeah. in response to distress. Yeah. So uh, uh, one of the uh, you know it, it's you know I, I find it to be very complex and interesting. So one thing that I did mention that uh, results in a differential stress response is genetics, right? So uh, one of the slides that was not, you know, I mean, I did some of the work with the cord blood, but the previous slide with, you know, a large group of uh, 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 participants uh, looking at genetic variation and their stress response definitely implicates at least genetics as a factor, right? Um, uh, you know, there, there's a risk allele. If, if you have the risk allele and then you have, exposure to a, uh, in this case, childhood trauma, then you are more likely to develop psychopathologies later on compared to somebody who's not exposed, even with the risk allele, or somebody who's exposed but has a protective allele, right? So there's a differential stress, you know, response later on. Uh, and talking about some of the other factors, of course, you know, the cytokine response is another uh, consequence of uh, uh, stress hormone exposure. So you have uh, usually uh, glucocorticoids are anti-inflammatory, right? You have hydrocortisone, you know, another glucocorticoid that you rub on your skin when you have inflammation, you know, when you have wet swelling and it makes it go away. But it turns out that there's other pro-inflammatory cytokines that are upregulated by stress hormone signaling. It depends on uh, I, I guess the uh, the condition of you know uh, the tissue and uh, the cell type, but IL six like TNF alpha in some studies are upregulated by stress hormones, whereas um, uh, many of the other uh, immune system is suppressed. Right, so you could easily envision uh, people having a differential uh, immune response, and you know the role of inflammation in some of these psychiatric disorders as well, having a uh, different factor, a uh, different response, uh, uh, because they, they have different contributions. Yeah. Actually, I would like to complement this question, asking you if you have any idea or you have, have ever read something about um, basal and long-term uh, stress, like uh, if the animal or even the person, the human, is under stress, it's a basal stress, if they respond differently for the cortisol for a trauma. Are you talking about humans or animals? Um, in both cases, I mean, if they, they are going to respond in the same way for the ventilation. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, um, remember, yeah, so this is, this is, uh, you know, as, as you said, complementing the previous question, yeah, there's a, definitely a differential response, right? I mean, so I could think of, uh, 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 what is that, the social defeat stress work done by Eric Nessler, you know, where he clearly identifies, you know, groups of animals that are, you know, resilient 
versus uh, uh, susceptible to stress, right? So you, you, uh, they undergo the exact same uh, stress regimen. And at the end, they have very different stress response in terms of their interaction with other, you know, social avoidance is one of the tests that they use to uh, assess resilience or susceptibility, right? And so they have a very different response. And then with humans, of course, uh, in, in addition to what I mentioned to you before, when you give uh, uh, people the, you know, the social stress test, you know, obviously, you know, it's not ethical. We are already highly stressed enough, but it's unethical to chronically torture somebody, you know, uh, like a human being. But, you know, there are some acute stressors that you could give people. And uh, I mean, there, there's a huge uh, range in the response that you get. And it, it depends on uh, their genetic makeup. And then, as you mentioned, you know, you know maybe their cytokine profile, uh, even the microbiota, the interaction with, you know, uh, the gut uh, bacteria. But, um, uh, you know, like I said, the uh, psychosocial stress, at least for humans, I think, is also very subjective, you know? So yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, doing these kind of uh, online meetings, sometimes I start getting, you know, panicky because, you know, I, I don't have a face to look at, you know, when I'm just reading, you know, looking at those slides, but other people might do just fine, you know? So it's, it's a very different response for humans too. I, I think you can close your presentation because they, they close it here. So actually you can have your, no oh, I think, yeah, I think it's closed. Yeah, it's closed. Someone closed okay. for you. Okay, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. So it might be better. At least you can see me, but uh, we can see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why, that's why I feel so much better. <laughs> okay, it's all you have for now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, so actually what I was asking is that you mentioned about uh, previous contact with the uh, courts, of, for example, if you have a previous um sensibilization, then you could possibly have a stronger effect later on. So I was just thinking that those uh, that are resilient animals, for example, or even human under long-term stress in a lower background, if they are going to respond uh, more strongly to a, new, uh, to a new stress situation. Uh, are, are you, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if you're saying if, if you are exposed to long-term stress before. Yeah, if you're going to the, be more sensitive to new stress, a new trigger. Yeah, yeah so I, I'm, I, this is something that I've also uh, been uh, researching recently. Um, so if you have had chronic stress for a long time, I, and I think, you know, obviously some of the work that I've done is, you know, basic science, right? It's in the cell line. And I'm now, you know, trying to look at some of the uh, behavior in the animals to show that it's actually the case that when you have a much stronger response later on that, you know, you're more susceptible, right? But I think that uh, recent, some there's some also recent evidence suggesting that, you know, if you have uh, maybe not chronic stress, but acute stress, you know, uh, repeatedly, you know, in a kind of in a training fashion, then uh, you may be resilient to uh, 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 stressors down the line. So, you know, it, it's, it's still a bit uh, unknown as to, you know, what magnitude and duration of the stressors actually precipitates a more harmful stress response and what leads to uh, resilience. I think that's a very important topic, especially, you know, for the military, right? Because uh, they want to know, you know, somebody who's been through combat, you know, how, you know, what factors uh, make it more likely for them to, you know, be gripped with fear, you know, in the second time they go on duty uh, tour uh, versus somebody who, you know, might not think too much of it, right? So that's that's an active area of research that I, I you know, I'm not quite aware, I'm not quite sure, but in, in terms of some of the molecular aspect of it, you know, uh, if you look at, you know, some of the epigenetic changes that occur, to change gene function, it definitely uh, not only work by me, but from other people too, that, you know, these previous exposure events act as kind of a primer. They, they prime your response for the second one to be more robust. Yeah, exactly. Uh, coming back to the audience again, there is another question from Rafaela, and she's thanking for the class, and uh, she's asking, 
if you ever found any evidence in the literature related to stress and ADHD. In what? I'm sorry. Uh, between stress and ADHD. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I between stress and and. It's a, a hyper hyper. Oh, ADHD. Yes, A A D A D. Yeah. Uh, I I think there's some evidence for that. Uh, so you know, um, that's one of the weird things that we found, but we never pursued because the evidence uh obviously require we need more replication. But you know, the core blood samples, right? Um. The core blood sample work that I briefly showed you guys, uh, where we looked at the core blood DNA of FKBP5, you know, for methylation, right? It turns out that in the group that had, you know, uh, in these methylation patterns in a kind of a sequence specific way, uh, you know, and that had mothers who had depression and anxiety. So, the, you know, in pediatrics, it's called toxic stress, right? It turns out that uh, there's a, uh, I think it was like uh, probably around 50% of some of these uh, uh, children that came from being exposed to this maternal toxic stress had ADHD. Uh, I, that was a kind of a, a, um, um, something that we weren't looking for, but we thought that was really interesting, but we never pursued it. And, and sure enough, I think that there's a lot of, uh, not, you know, not, I'm sorry, not, not a lot, but you know, I mean, there's a lot of evidence for stress uh, in, in utero and some of the consequences. Uh, I'm not quite aware uh, if the evidence is really strong because I, I, I don't know the literature between stress and ADHD, but I thought that was a weird, uh, uh, significant finding that we had, uh, especially with that cohort. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. It's related with the um, uh, premature or early, early aging in uh, psychiatric disorders. So, like uh, schizophrenia patients can um, that prematurely. Uh, we know that there is some correlation with uh, the lens of the telomere, but uh, is there any kind of um, DNA mutilation related with uh, early aging? Yeah, so. So this, so actually, uh, I've actually, uh, some of the animal models that I've used, uh, uh, you know, and human samples. So there's a manuscript that I've been sitting on for like a year, uh, looking at, you know, models of uh, stress, models of stress hormone exposure in mice and rats and in human Cushing's and, you know, in the healthy uh, uh, um, human cohort that I uh, mentioned to you guys uh, uh, in the slides. In all of these cases, there's a uh, very nice uh, or not uh, a, a significant relationship between the amount of stress or glucocorticoid exposure and telomere length. Uh, now, because of the pandemic and um, and because the reviewer asked for you know <laughs> comparison between the qPCR method and the uh, the old radio you know radioactivity method of you know. Uh, measuring telomere length, I you know we, we took a long time because of the pandemic uh, uh, reasons, but uh, yeah, so absolutely, I I think if if uh, telomere is really a, a measure of uh, premature or or aging, then definitely uh, we found across multiple species evidence for uh, excess Google corticoid exposure and shortening uh, telomere length, and there's also uh, a, even probably even more Ac, you know, accurate or powerful method of assessing uh, epigenetics. So this is the epigenetic clock by uh, Dr. Horvath at uh, UCLA. So you know, looking, you know, he he uses the uh, the uh, Illumina uh, epic array or the methylation array, uh, looking at you know at that time 400,000, 4, 450 CPGs and identifying very specific uh, CG methylation patterns associated with aging. So since the publication of his, uh, I guess his uh, groundbreaking paper, uh, there's been a whole slew of uh, work using that platform, you know, for various diseases to look at premature aging. And so um, I, I did not follow um, uh, that literature as closely because I think that, you know, uh, the telomeres and even you know work my work that I do with telomeres some work that I've done with telomeres and 
some of the work that's done with epigenetics is aging is kind of uh, uh, indicative of kind of general disease burden. So I don't think it's very specific to psychiatric disorders, but uh, I think there's definitely uh, lots of studies. If you look up Horvath clock uh, and epigenetics, you'll definitely find a lot of papers looking at you know psychiatric disorders and non-psychiatric disorders and premature aging. There's definitely evidence for that. Yeah, I do agree with you because most of the disease is actually finished with uh, oxidative stress and uh, this yeah. is closely related with aging. So it's yep. very difficult to indicate this for a specific disease. But uh, right. in the case of psychiatric disorder, we have also the use of antipsychotics that are quite strong um, medications with a lot of side effects. So they right, might have right. the effect of the drug and not only of the disease. Right. And, you know, um, some of the work uh, recently done by me and, uh, and previously by other people, I think, uh, also, uh, now that you mentioned uh, psych uh, psychotropic medications, is that uh, even like some of the, even many of the SSRIs, you know, that are supposed to uh, work at the serotonin uh, transport level are actually affecting glucocorticoid signaling. So uh, I'm sure that's not their intended effect, but I, I think there, there's now several uh, studies that show that, uh, uh, you know, treatment with uh, uh, antidepressants, especially, you know, um, SSRIs, uh, normalize uh, glucocorticoid signaling in animal models of stress and uh, in psychiatric patients. Great, Richard. So uh, if there is no any more questions, I just would like to thank you for your great presentation. And for this long discussion, you might be hungry because of the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if, uh, so thank you once more. Yep. And I hope we can keep in touch. Yeah, of course. Have a nice lunch. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much for this invitation. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.